welcome to Taylor Wessing for this um, Harvard Business School alumni event. It'll be, um, I've been really looking forward to this um, event. We've been involved in um, Bitcoin and, and trading platforms and we've certainly had a lot of inquiries around ICOs um, and so on over the last few months. So um, it'll be a fascinating discussion hopefully and um, hopefully you, you, will, you will all enjoy it and join us for a drink afterwards where I'm sure we've got to ask further questions um, of the panellists. Um, for those of you, of you who don't know Taylor Wessing, we're, we're, we're an international law firm with offices in 20 odd jurisdictions and it's been our pleasure to support um, this group over the last few years um, and I've for one, have always enjoyed these sessions and the pitch sessions that we've had. Um, it, uh, the, the topics are always interesting and the companies are always great. So uh, without further ado, I'll hand over to Matt um, and hope you all have a very good evening. Thank you. Good evening and welcome. Uh, I'm Matthew Wilson, the Harvard Business School Alumni Angels, and really thrilled to have all of you here today. Um, you know, this is, as you can probably tell, an oversubscribed event, and thank you, Janet, for uh, managing all the registrations. Uh, the event will also be, is being recorded, and um, will be broadcast over social media within the next coming days. Um, and you know, for me, uh, Bitcoin kind of has been a personal story, much as my first connection to the internet. I can remember when my father first brought home an IBM computer and hearing the dial tone and, and the modem connecting to the internet for the first time. And really what we're seeing developed in the blockchain space is a, it's an alternate network that's a flow of information and payment. And uh, there's some brilliant technological innovations <coughs> and really that's what I'm hoping we can get to, uh, to explore a little bit tonight. Um, at the same time, digital assets can kind of be a polarizing topic uh, there is a lot of hype in the news. Um, you know, they're unbacked by physical commodities, government obligation, and um, kind of as a result, they rely on uh, cryptographic protection and a peer-to-peer -peer settlement layer. So, you know, we'll get to the bottom of all what that means today. Um, and, uh, but the polarizing bit is a belief in digital assets. Um, you know, they call into question the intrinsic value of money, property, and, and assets. Um, so accepting this future reality can be a little bit difficult, at, at least it was for me when I first heard about Bitcoin. Um, so the genesis of the evening planning, when I was planning the event was to bring together pretty much the top person representing the top company in each one of the aspects, um, from investing, uh, payments, wallet holding and banks, enterprise, uh, and then also emerging ICOs and emerging ICO funds. Um, so really excited to have everybody on the panel today. Um, but before we introduce you to our moderator, I wanted to thank Howard Palmer and Taylor Wessing for being so gracious and hosting us in their lovely offices. And please stay around afterwards. We will uh, we'll be hosting reception. So without further ado, uh, please join me in welcoming Nicholas Carey, president and co-founder of blockchain.com. Uh, Nicholas is a serial entrepreneur whose experience has been colored by a global upbringing, from living through hyperinflation in Argentina to understanding firsthand the difficulties of sending money internationally through the global banking system. Uh, launched in 2013, Nicholas's company Blockchain now has over 15 million users, manages the most widely used developer platform for digital assets, and has raised over 75 million from venture capital firms and institutional investors in the effort of building a radically better financial system. So please join me in welcoming Nicholas Carey. He'll begin with a high-level overview of Bitcoin blockchain, and then uh, we'll begin our moderated panel. Thanks. All right, thank you very much. Good evening. Um, I hope to make good use of everyone's time tonight. Uh, I get to travel a lot, and uh, I have to give a lot of credit to Matthew. Um, I've never actually seen a panel that's probably this stacked that talks uh, about our industry and we'll have as much fluency in the topic as we have here tonight. So I don't say that lightly, but there is a lot of signal versus noise and tonight you're going to get a lot of signal about our industry. Now, 
a lot of us are on a journey learning together, and we're at the very beginning of discovering some pretty interesting things. Um, I hope that we get to share a little bit with you about what we're learning and get some criticism and also um, hopefully uh, develop some ideas together because the world is about to get very weird <laughs> in the next few years. And um, I think for the most part, there'll be some significant opportunities uh, for people to have the foresight um, to invest and to capitalize on those things. So in short, um, I want to thank Taylor Westing. I want to thank the Harvard Business School and the uh, Alumni Network here um, for inviting everyone and for putting together this incredible panel. Uh, you guys have some very special minds to, to tap into tonight, so I hope you take advantage of that. Um, I'll let them all introduce themselves since they'll probably do a much better job uh, than I can do. But what I wanted to share with you a little bit was um, the story that uh, I've witnessed across our space for the last couple of years. Um, my background is uh, I studied uh, international political economy um, I started my first uh, web development company when I was 17 with my best friend. And I've only ever worked in technology businesses, so I've been surrounded by computers and the web since I was a kid. Um, Ten years ago, I traveled to India for the first time where I taught computer science and creative writing, and I'm headed back there this week. I'm really excited to see how the world's kind of changed uh, there. I see incredible opportunities in different places to bring digital efficiencies to markets that have traditionally lacked them. Um, you know, I think one of the most interesting things to me is that most people spend their entire lives in pursuit of money. And for a lot of people in the world, they don't really understand what creates value. They just uh, trade labor and then they get things to exchange for other things that they need. And we haven't really had a real thoughtful exercise in looking at what properties that money has that create value. What are the properties that define uh, value in our, in our current modern world? Um, and so. One of the things that's pretty interesting to me is that we are really at a moment in time where we get to reevaluate that. And so human beings, since the dawn of existence, have optimized environments. You know, we used to live in caves, and then we built shelters. We used to walk around, we invented the wheel, we paved roads. We've made things better around ourselves, and so why can't we invent a better form of money? And this is really sort of the intellectual exercise a lot of us are on in this industry. And so. Um, about eight years ago, uh, someone came along and wrote uh, a white paper to propose a significantly different uh, idea about how to exchange value. And uh, that project built what is now known as the Bitcoin blockchain. And now there are actually hundreds and hundreds of copies, thousands of iterations of networks that are tinkering and changing variables and defining completely new networks to create value, to store value, and to exchange value. And uh, through this explosion of innovation, we're going to see some pretty neat things come forward, I think. So uh, without monopolizing too much time tonight, um, I really want to get to our panel. Um, but when we, when we think about what money means to us and what properties money has, you know, we, we've tried a lot of different things. We used to, uh, in fact, the, the earliest form of, of human writing is tabulation. We noticed people keeping track of who owned uh, who owed things to, to whom. And then uh, there's uh, early uh, viewings of people using seashells and feathers, uh, coins. We use paper money. Um, we converted that paper into digital uh, binary notes. And then uh, now we're at an interesting point in time where a computer science innovation has created something known as digital scarcity. This is a really big idea. And so if one of the things you take away from tonight um, can be this, I implore you to, to let this sink in. For the last 30 years, we've had a problem uh, with digital goods. If I take a photograph of everybody in this room and Matt sends it to Danny and Danny sends it to Alex, and Alex sends it to somebody else, it's hard to know which one was the original. If money can be counterfeited, it becomes useless. If digital goods can become counterfeited, they become less valuable. This is a fairly common concept. But with digital assets like Bitcoin, we pioneered the ability to define digital scarcity, an atomically unique digital good. And with the ability to do that, we can reimagine the way we apply value to things all over the world. We can literally give all the things in the world an identity, and this allows us to do interesting things with money. So that is the broad uh, paintbrush across which we are painting a new economic fabric. What we're doing in our industry is essentially creating a, a, a cradle that we're wrapping the whole world in that allows it, uh, anyone in the world to essentially make economic transactions affordably, instantly, and purely digitally. 
And if you compare the ability to do that with how inconvenient it is to use uh, other types of value transfer systems, you'll start to see why this industry is developing so much momentum. So it's 2017, and the reality is that it's uh, faster for me to call FedEx to come here and pick up this podium and ship it to New York than it is for me to send $1,000 from here to New York. That's really silly in 2017. So if you don't think that money can become digital, um, I would implore you to potentially reevaluate that position because a lot of things have become digital. We used to... Uh, go buy books, and now we know that we can download any book instantly from any device basically for free. And we have the world's library at our fingertips. We used to go buy records, and now we can get any music on any device instantly basically for free. So we changed the way media works, we've changed the way telecommunications work, and I think we can change the way finance works too. Um, and so, without further ado, um, I wanted to put a challenge to the panel because uh, as I'm building my business, I'm constantly recruiting and hiring new people, and um, I have three interview questions I always ask everyone, and the first thing I ask people is to teach me something they know a lot about. So this implies that they have excellent communication skills, they will usually go in a direction they're passionate about, and I get to actually learn something during the day, which is uh, one of my core missions. Um, I always ask them what's the hardest thing they've ever done, because when you're building a company or you're running a startup, um, it can be a real struggle, and I want to know that the people I work with uh, know how to row in the ship, and that's an interesting question. The last one, though, is I asked them to explain to me, um, how would you explain Bitcoin to your mother? And sometimes they tell me that that is the most difficult thing that they have ever done. And so um, it's kind of hard to talk about the industry uh, a little bit without talking about why we're all able to be here. And so. I think it's interesting because when you pose this question to people, you will get different answers. And uh, I think it's interesting if each of you could try succinctly and maybe 15 to 20 seconds answer the question, what is Bitcoin? And uh, then we'll go on and I have a lot of topics tonight. Um, we're gonna be conscious of people's time. We're gonna explore applications of blockchain smart contracts and digital assets in general. Um, I want to talk about the impact of decentralization and blockchain technology broadly. Uh, I want to talk about interesting new business models. Some of you are already implementing these, um, and I'm really excited to hear, uh, especially from the guy on the end there, what he's thinking about. Um, I want to hear what your investment thesis is. You know, you guys are staking your careers on this stuff. Why? And what is your thesis for investing your most precious commodity, which is your time? And if we have time, we're going to talk a little bit about the rise of ICOs. Um, ICOs stand for Initial Coin Offerings. It's a way to form capital in a digital way uh, that no one really saw coming 12 months ago. And uh, billions and billions of dollars are pouring into technology startups around the world with this new vehicle. And uh, I think we'd be remiss to not discuss it. So short, 15, 20 seconds. What does Bitcoin mean to you or what is Bitcoin? And I'll role play being your mother. <laughs> so. well, that, that sounded wrong. <laughs> <laughs> Danny! <laughs> so, uh, can everybody hear? Because I'm not sure what the microphone situation is. Are good with the vocals? Um, so, uh, well, Matt, uh, I don't know where Matt went, but Matt was, talk Matt was talking about his father being, you know, having got a computer and plugging it in. I was that father. I'm the, probably the <laughs> oldest one here. I came from Wall Street. My mother, uh, probably a slightly religious type, so let's put it in biblical terms. Uh, I think Bitcoin is a siren, uh, Bitcoin is a jubilee. Um, it would take you to the Old Testament and to Leviticus where on the Day of Atonement every 49 years there is a revolution and we find a way to uh, account for our debt and, and to tr make our transactions uh, in a different way. Bitcoin to me is that jubilee and it heralds a change from an analog economy to a digital economy. Thank you. <laughs> All right. <laughs> <Okay>, Mom. <laughs> All right. Uh, Zichan. Um, I did have this conversation with my mom, and <laughs> <laughs> the way I explained it to her was, it's a, nothing as fancy as yours, it's just a way of establishing ownership in a digital world uh, that we haven't been able to do before, and then to be able to transfer that value, that ownership, to somebody else in a trustless manner. I, you know, it's taking the concept of photographs as you did earlier, that you, you can establish who owned who, which one was the original, and I think blockchain did that. So simplest way, who owns it, and when, when they transfer it. Cool. 
Sorry, I skipped the order. So, <laughs> Danny. Danny makes me Danny. Yeah, sorry. About that. <laughs> um, yeah, I, I joined Ripple about four and a half years ago, and um, I do remember having the conversation with my mother, trying to explain what the hell was was going on. And um, I, I would say that the the number one thing that I saw was it, it was the first time in history that you were able to represent uh, an asset electronically. So if you think about um, the money that's in your in your bank card um, that is stored electronically at your bank, like say HSBC, um, that is a liability, it's not an asset. What you hold there is, is not true, true money. Um, and in fact, all forms of electronic money prior to Bitcoin had been liabilities, and this was the first time it was an asset, and that's a huge breakthrough. You can now do all kinds of things around it and build a whole ecosystem around it, which is the point that we're at right now. Nice. Jeremy. So I am not going to define Bitcoin. I'm going to define Ethereum. <laughs> <laughs> because my company develops Ethereum. Um, Ethereum is Bitcoin for any digital asset. So Bitcoin is fundamentally is a store of value and a value transfer blockchain, um, which allows me to have n number of Bitcoins and transfer some portion of that to Nick or Danny or Jen or Zia, what have you and we can and thereby exchange value. Ethereum allows you to do that for any asset through the use of smart contracts. Thank you. Alex? As everyone already has done it brilliantly, I'll be very specific <laughs> and say it's magic internet money. <laughs> <laughs> nice. <laughs> what you said. <laughs> uh, well, Bitcoin's a digital asset where you could do peer-to-peer -peer transaction, and it's the fundamental thing about Bitcoin, I said, I would say it's really based on a trusted community, and that's really the, the real essence of it. And uh, it really comes from the philosophy, I think, so that uh, a lot of peer-to-peer -peer, uh, download uh, stations took place in the early 90s with Napster and going forward with email. And this a little bit the same philosophy behind it, where you can do transactions on a peer-to-peer. -peer. Thanks. All right. Um, well, I hope that gives you a bit of perspective on some of the different uh, perspectives that people have that are working in the industry. Um, I guess let's do a quick round of introductions. Please tell us who you are and uh, what your business does in the space. Um, and let's keep that to two minutes per person. I'll start timing. Uh, we'll do it quicker than that, Nick. So um, yeah, I'm Danny Masters. I'm the chairman of a couple of companies that are, are pretty active uh, in the space. Um, Global Advisors, Jersey Limited is a regulated investment manager. We explain um, the investment thesis behind digital assets uh, to what I call legacy world um, investors. Uh, we have an expert team uh, which we've assembled over the last four or five years to operate these, um, uh, these instruments and we create uh, vehicles fit for purpose. So um, through Global Advisors and through our sell side brand, uh, which is CoinShares, um, we have a number of products, but primarily that is uh, the Global Advisors Bitcoin Investment Fund, um, the world's first regulated investment fund in Bitcoin that's uh, now three years old. Um, the uh, uh, CoinShares XBT, which is a NASDAQ listed Bitcoin tracking certificate, two of them actually, um, that uh, uh, are available on NASDAQ, uh, OMX and Stockholm. And uh, most recently CoinShares Fund 1, which is an Ethereum denominated um, uh, fund for the investment in uh, initial coin offerings. Thank you, Dan. <coughs> All right, Danny? I'm Danny Aranda. I'm a managing director for Europe at Ripple. Um, Ripple is a technology company. We create a blockchain-based uh, infrastructure for financial institutions uh, focused on doing cross-border payments and settlement. Um, our primary customer today are, are banks, so very traditional financial institutions, and they include folks like Bank of America, Standard Chartered, Santander here in the UK, Royal Bank of Canada. Uh, and a number of others, and essentially this uh, gives rise to a, a global payment network that can move money as easily as information moves, so things settle instantly with better transparency and, uh, and lower cost. Thank you. Zishan? Um, I'm Zishan, I'm the CEO for Europe for Coinbase. We're a, uh, there's a bunch of stuff we do. We're a wallet, um, where it's a brokerage, you can buy and sell cryptocurrencies. Uh, we operate an exchange, which is GDAX and we recently launched an Ethereum browser, an app called Toshi. Um, we are a very small part in this, or a small focused role in this industry, and that's to really be the on-ramp, where you can come in, you can convert fiat into crypto, crypto into fiat, 
and that's the that's the sort of corridor that we focus on. Thanks, Jeremy. Uh, sure. So when my bio was sent in for this, we were 200 people in 14 company countries. We are now 350 people in 24 countries. Our company is effectively a microcosm of the overall blockchain ecosystem. We do four principal things. One is we build platforms and products ranging from protocol engineering at the Ethereum network. We process over a billion transactions a day on the public computing network. Um, we build accounting systems for blockchain applications, balance three. We build land registries. We build lots and lots of product. Um, the second aspect of this is enterprise uh, strategy and delivery. We advise and help companies implement blockchain, ranging from some of the banks that have been mentioned previously to global governments, such as the Monetary Authority of Singapore and the Smart Dubai Office, among others. The third leg is Consensus Academy, which is blockchain education. It's been widely reported that there is a shortage of blockchain engineers, and we've decided to change that. Um, we have we recently had about 1,500 people apply for our academy, about 150 people have gone through it, um, all free of charge, some of whom hopefully will work for consensus, but if nothing else, we've created a bunch of blockchain engineers. And the final area is consensus capital. We operate a blockchain venture capital fund. We do token launches on behalf of other companies, and our asset management group does something quite similar to what Daniel does. Thank you. Alex? Alex Sokovnikov, uh, I'm a founder of Semantic Capital, investing in decentralized technology companies and projects. Uh, prior to that, until recently, I ran investments for Deloitte Ventures, Deloitte's corporate fund in London. Uh, and I also started Deloitte's blockchain business and ran that for three years. Thank you. Cyrus? Um, I'm founder of a Swiss Borg. Uh, essentially, what we're doing, we're creating a Swiss cyber bank that's based on a meritocratic system. We're really utilizing the fact of uh, tokenization of different funds and different strategies, and as well decentralizing this process through our investment management platform. As of today, we have a platform where essentially have different token funds. These different token funds represent different portfolios of cryptocurrencies that are divided into different strategies, different risk profiles, and as well different investment universe. And basically, if you're institutional or retail or a DAO company, you could come on, on our platform and we could then advise you to, to pick the very best tokens to have the best risk return our portfolio. And going forward, we're going to be adding more holistic wealth management solutions, and that's the reason why we're going for an ICO on November 21st. Cool. All right. Um, so because everyone had a different reason in some ways to get started in this space, uh, I think it'd be helpful um, for the audience to hear a little bit about maybe what application specifically, although there are many, that you're sort of most excited about right now. And let's go in reverse order so that we kind of uh, go a different direction this time. Guys, so, can I ask everybody to speak up just a little bit? Thank you. I think the people in the front are going to be fine, the people behind me will probably struggle. So a little bit more volume. Thank you. Roger that. So, I mean, why did we get into blockchains? First, like the philosophy, again, we came from the, the age where, you know, when you wanted to get something, a new music, right, I used to break that. So, the, so the best thing we could do was to go on Napster, and Napster, you would, you would meet someone and start talking to him and say, okay, can I download the song? And it appeared to be low, and be like, yeah, cool. Then after the meal came in, you didn't need to talk to these persons, it was based more on a community. And we, we started, but really like to understand how together, all together in one room, we could be much better than all individuals in different companies. So unfortunately, I started to go into private banking and then hedge fund algo trading, which is more for the reserve people, not really utilizing the community, but more everyone working on different projects. And we started doing that on a more individuals, for high net worth individuals, and doing customized investment mandates. But we realized that through blockchain, you could do so much better. So we looked at that as an asset class, and we said, OK, we're starting to do great performance, much better than any other hedge fund manager in the world. But more importantly, we started to understand the technology that's behind the blockchain. And through blockchain, you could create a fund within a few seconds. You could go on a GitHub, copy, paste, and create a smart, uh, uh, you, could, you could create a token, and that could be like a fund. You don't need to go through 10,000 layers of different people to create a fund. It's just magically you could just create this token and that could be an investment vehicle Then you could after have these different tailor-made investment proposals. And go a little bit farther down, we, we understood really the, tick, the philosophy behind it is that why would do we need to manage every strategy that we offer to our clients? 
more importantly, we can maybe find someone based in Turkey or someone based in, 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 in Slovakia or in Russia and really using like a platform that you could bring in the most smartest investment managers and really utilize the swarm intelligence out of it. So that's why we really had to pivot a bit our business model and really focus on blockchain technology and philosophy. So. Thank you. One of the topics I'm very excited about is identity and identity management. Um, and it's a big, big issue right now, both in, in the traditional space and in the crypto space. So um, actually, blockchain technology allows probably for the first time for people to be able to control their own identity in a secure way to be able to transfer elements of that identity, documents which are attached to their identity, again in a controlled way, and then potentially revoke access to their identity when they don't need certain people to have access to it anymore. So um, that's one of the big, big themes which I find super exciting, and right now there's a lot of friction in this space. Yeah, that's a super interesting one. Um, the United Nations is piloting a variety of projects related to this. The World Economic Forum is spearheading some work here as well. Um, it's very expensive and difficult for people to prove who they are. And it costs companies a fortune to comply with proving who they are. And on top of that, that, uh, that regulation sometimes uh, causes some adverse effects. So the past five or six years have, been, have seen an increasing number of compromises of personal information online. And uh, this is probably going to get worse um, over time. Companies are being forced to control large amounts of personal identifying information. And as they get bigger, they have larger and larger amounts of that. And when those silos of information get bigger, the uh, incentives to breach and break those systems grow as well. And so you can imagine a world where maybe when you're shopping online, the only thing that the company needs is really the payment information. If I'm buying music, um, from iTunes, they don't necessarily need to know all of the other information that's associated with my credit card, right? Where I live, my telephone number, the rest of that. They just need a payment, like if I walked into a store and handed over a 20 pound note. There are lots of use cases like that that make sense. Um, there are more complicated ones. You could imagine with electronic medical healthcare records, there are certain personal details that I might want to share with my physician, but that I wouldn't want to share with my psychiatrist. I don't want to go on a Facebook and start getting a whole bunch of self-help books, right? That's a bit of an invasion of my privacy. But that's the world we live in today because of the browsing histories we have. If we have more sovereignty and control over our identities, not just in these uh, kind of basic examples, but more broadly, um, there are some really interesting applications. So sorry to intrude there, but um, very interesting work being done in the identity space here. Uh, Jeremy? So uh, are we doing origins in blockchain as well? Yeah, or, yeah, sure. Or what, you know, what you're most interested in right now is uh, an application of blockchain technology. Uh, <laughs> So the most exciting project to me in blockchain is called Consensus. Um, the reason why it's exciting to, me, exciting to me is I get to work on everything in blockchain at once, which is also quite daunting and takes a huge amount of time. Um, we work on self-sovereign identity, we work on payment systems, we work on trading crypto. Um, so I really love what I do. Um, and every day there is a many, many new challenges, perhaps the most intense one is increasing talent density as we scale and retaining our decentralized culture. Um, how I got into this space is my career had three phases. I worked on the Java program at Oracle. I was an investment banker at Goldman Sachs. And then I worked in venture, including doing a couple of deals with Howard for a number of years. And so when I found blockchain, it was uh, very obvious to me that this was going to change just about everything. Thanks. All right, Dijon? You stole my answer. Um, so I studied cryptography in 2004, and, and that's where my interest came from. Um, I went through a cycle of being in financial services for the next 10 years until um, I got the opportunity to dive back in uh, from a career point of view into this, which is, which is great. Um, so piggybacking off of uh, what Jeremy said, I think I'm most excited about the applications for blockchain, not one, but the efficiencies it has the potential for introducing cryptocurrencies is just one tiny part of it. You know, uh, if you look at projects like logistics and, and what having a blockchain can do for shipping. Um, you look at, I, I'd love, I see a day where I'll be buying my house in a blockchain, I'll be buying, I bought a flat in London um, last, a couple of years ago, 
and the amount of people involved in that and in the process was just painful. So um, I think it's it's very blockchain itself, the technology and its applications are revolutionary. The efficiency the efficiencies it introduces are is what, what I find most exciting. Thank you. Um, I wanted to take a quick sentiment poll of the audience, so to make sure that we're not getting lost in some vocabulary here. So, without being shy, does anyone feel uh, like they do not really understand what a blockchain is yet? Because we should take some time to, to answer that. All right. I think if we multiply that by the number of people that probably feel that way, uh, then we'll be at the right number. Um, I think it'd be helpful if maybe just a couple of you who feel confident answering this, how would you define a blockchain? in 30 seconds, like why does a blockchain, why does it matter to use a blockchain? Why wouldn't you use an Oracle database or something else? Because understanding why um, we're all building software and technologies on top of this tool set is relevant, I think, so. Uh, I'm happy to take a stab at that. The, you know, I'll explain it the way I explain it to clients. Yeah, what is a blockchain? Yeah, so, and this is gonna be slightly non-technical. So there the way we describe at least the technology we work on is having five key attributes. First is digital signatures. It's the ability to digitally identify any act or any transaction and the origin of any piece of data with cryptographic proof. I can prove you signed the transfer of your house title to me. In fact, I can see when you bought it, when you paid your taxes, when you got your mortgage, each monthly repayment of your mortgage, all digitally signed because every transaction is digitally signed in the view, right? Digital signatures. Second thing is something called a distributed ledger. Distributed ledger is, well it's a ledger, except for everyone gets a copy of it, right? So he can see all of my transactions, I can see all of his transactions, they're all there cryptographically signed in right? Third element is something we call smart contracts. Smart contracts are neither smart, they're not contracts. But if we're gonna do something like housing settlement on the blockchain, he has to follow the same rules as I do. Which means if we write down a set of rules for how the transaction will be governed, we need to share those rules, and those rules need to be exactly the same, and neither of us can cheat. So, so smart contracts allow you to define rules that are cryptographically signed and live on this distributed ledger, so everyone's playing by the same rules. If you look at things like stock clearing, payments, health records, that's a critical component. So, so from a house buying point of view, the smart contract actually cuts out the, the lawyer, the conveyancer, the, like half the people that are involved in it, because yeah. I can actually see the terms we have on the contract. It's transparent to me, transparent to Jeremy, and with that comes a level of trust that I know I won't get cheated through it. Yeah, and then the fourth element of it is tokenization. So because we can digitally prove every event and every transaction and every piece of data ever, because everyone gets a copy of the ledger, because we can have immutable sets of business rules that we've all agreed to, we can then represent digital assets and break them up into very small pieces and trade them with each other. So we call that tokenization, right? Which is using those underlying transaction capabilities to represent more complex assets. And finally, it comes back to identity, having this federated self-sovereign identity that we can use to not only just randomly sign something, but be able to co collect pieces of data about ourselves and control how they are, right? So I may not know, um, I may not know my brother to know my net worth every day, right? I may not want that visibility over it. Or I may not want my psychiatrist to know my dental records or whatever it is. So digital signatures, distributed ledger, smart contracts, tokenization, and self-sovereign identity are the five key elements in terms of how we describe what makes blockchain special. And because of those capabilities, because of that, what we call veridical computing, this trust network, it can be used to implement just about any distributed and decentralized system. So the Union Square Ventures nicely says in most of these talks, if you built Uber on the blockchain, right, there would be no Uber, <laughs> and the drivers and the riders would participate in the value creation because it would just be a series of smart contracts, tokens, and identities. Yeah, when people talk about this being the Uber moment of banking, they're really missing the whole point. <clears throat> this isn't like Uber, this is like we invented global value teleportation and everyone gets to participate. Can I, can I have one more crack at that? Yeah, please. <laughs> I'm going to go down a level to sort of O level as opposed to the PhD level. Um, and, and um, you know, we all, we're all used to seeing on our computer screens or our drop boxes a whole raft of files. You've got your, you know, your information file, your house file, your work file, your family file, and all this, you know, you can have 50 files. And you can jump in and out of those files anytime you want. You can change one, you can change another one. And it becomes a kind of a jumble. Right? Because you don't know when you were, you can check, but you don't really know when you were in the last one. You don't know how that one relates to that one. 
What a blockchain really is, is a filing system. And it's a filing system where the files do not exist in a two-dimensional space, they exist in a one-dimensional space. And therefore, each file contains a piece of information which is written, confirmed, immutable, visible by large numbers of people, because this linear, block, this linear filing system is visible to everybody. And then the one that comes after it secures the one before it so it can't be changed cryptographically. And then you can put new information in that one, um, which then in turn becomes sealed uh, and you add another one. So your <coughs> the time stamping <coughs> sequence of this allows you to build a picture of the information that has gone in the past um, that is very, very straightforward and very analytical and very easy to understand in a way that you can't do in this sort of two-dimensional space. By the way, there's a whole industry of consultants that spend their entire <laughs> careers answering this question for lots of people. So, um, <laughs> yeah, if you guys, would other people like to define a blockchain? No. <laughs> <laughs> I think that was a very good explanation. Yeah, it's, it, it's like time yeah. where events are sequenced and it's like time you're filming as well, so you know what happened and you can't change it. I think that's one, one really key point there that once something is in a block, it's, as far as a blockchain, it's, it's immutable, it cannot be changed. And therefore you can trust it because only certain people with certain cryptographic keys can make or add stuff to it. So it's it's... You know, it can't be changed. That's one key element of it. I don't know if I'll take a stab at answering this. Mm -hmm. I have uh, tried many different approaches. Um, the one that seems to work for me most of the time is to basically envision a spreadsheet, one like Excel that we use, but except instead of there being one copy, there are copies of it all over the world. And anyone can use this utility to essentially document things that have happened. And so we now have a property rights system for the whole world that nobody individually controls and anyone on the planet can borrow uh, basically to keep track of things. Um, so that, that's how I like to think of it. All of those answers were really good and I'm totally gonna borrow some of those things and use them in future explanations. Um, so for anyone here that hasn't actually experienced uh, a digital currency transaction, I hope that you stick around after this. Uh, you should download a wallet from the App Store while you're waiting in here. And uh, you can go to Coinbase or go to Blockchain and download a wallet. And I will send you a digital currency transaction and you will see what this is like. It may not be as impressive to do it face to face when you consider that you could do it internationally or from here to the space station and it would have the same transactional costs. But when you start to think about the cost of signing up or downloading a free app that basically builds a financial utility on your phone that is completely open source and you compare that experience to what it would take to go set up a bank account in Canary Wharf tomorrow, you'll start to understand why there's so much friction in this space and why there's so much opportunity too. And that's just on the financial side, not the other application. So I wanted to give Danny and Danny a shot too at answering uh, what they're most passionate about in terms of the, the opportunity that blockchain can provide um, for you. Yeah, if I think about the really big opportunity, um, you know, this has been said a lot, but we think this is the beginning of a new kind of internet. And if you think of examples of where the internet has worked really well, um, take an application like Instagram, which was started by uh, two, two people, right, who had kind of a minimal amount of investment. And they were able to use all kinds of uh, open source frameworks, kind of just different uh, utilities available to them to bundle an app together and go out and take over one of the largest markets on the internet, which was photo sharing. And they were able to do that in a couple of months with minimal capital. And I, I think that's a really powerful thing when you can get really, really efficient to take over really, really big markets. And I think in the kind of crypto space, uh, we're, we're still at a very early stage. We still need all these frameworks to be developed. We still need all this infrastructure around just the kind of core basic databases of Bitcoin, Ethereum, and, and other digital currencies. Um, but that's beginning to be built through the applications which Zsham is saying so excited about. I think the number one uh, application that we're excited about at Ripple in the near term, um, because we feel like we can act on it today, is really about uh, cross-border payments. Like Ripple is all about making money move, and that's all we focus on. Um, as an organization, we really care that we uh, do one thing really, really well, and from there we're going to be able to expand. So um, we think that international payments is probably one of the first use cases to, to go, and that's all we spend our time on. Thanks.
Um, okay, so the, the thing that I'm finding uh, most interesting at the moment here, uh, all full disclosure, Jamie Diamond used to be my boss, uh, but I'm not, I'm, not, I'm not a plant. Um, I, I really did switch over to the other side. Um, and when I did that uh, a number of years ago, um, I, I was a very lonely person in the digital asset world. And, and I, I looked back to the place that I come from, came from, and, and my, my goal at that moment was to explain you know, why I thought Bitcoin was exciting. I mean, I hadn't conceived, the theorem didn't exist at that point, and we hadn't conceived of all of these other things, but why specifically I thought Bitcoin was interesting. Now you wind the clock forward four or five years, and what is really surprising me at the moment is that the digital asset economy, the, or the in digital investment uh, ecosystem, if you like, is becoming self-sustaining. And we've started to coin this phrase, escape velocity, where what I see happening in the digital asset universe is not just Bitcoin disrupting the, uh, the, the, the system for money and gold, but Ethereum disrupting the system for forming capital. And ICOs um, to, on the built on the Ethereum network and others um, are creating even more esoteric kind of utilities that actually can start to port real world commodities and real world assets into the digital economy. Now, I spent a lot of time trying to attract investors and we've, done, you know, we've been successful in doing that from the old world to this new digital asset world. And as you can see from the capitalization of digital networks over 150 billion now, uh, that has been uh, both organic and, um, and through, through subscription from outside. But what's interesting right now is that this world itself is becoming self-sustaining. So we're seeing collateralized lending, you know, companies like Salt Lending who are, who are taking your digital asset portfolio and actually lending you the cash you need to operate your real life. We saw an amazing re corporate restructuring done entirely through digital tokens when Bitfinex had an issue back in June of 2015. Um, we're seeing insurance solutions where there is peer-to-peer -peer cover for digital assets amongst and between members of the digital economy. And, and we're seeing a wealth effect where we're, you know, a lot, there have been a lot of Ethereum and Bitcoin millionaires coined in the last you know, year or two. They are not cashing out. Yeah. They are redeploying their, their, their wealth amongst and between this, the, the members of the new digital economy. And that's, that is the, I never thought in such a short space of time that this uh, economy would become uh, self-fulfilling, self-sustaining. That's a really interesting point. There are thousands and thousands of people in the world that will never make another investment except for in digital assets, and a lot of them are millionaires. Um, yeah. Jamie Diamond uh, recently has been in the press quite a bit um, coming after uh, the industry, and I think it's, it's funny because he thinks about it so uh, myopically, um, and it really has grown significantly beyond just Bitcoin. There's a lot of interesting projects going on, um, and in my own opinion, he's running a financials like steam locomotive, uh, so it's going to be an interesting race. Um, but I wanted to, to get Alex's opinion on something. Um, you know, there's some really interesting business models that are emerging here that don't look like things you guys have probably ever invested in before, um, and so. You know, uh, Alex is a PhD in mathematics, and uh, I won't go through his whole background, but he knows the teams that are building these things very, very well. He's invested in a lot of these projects, um, and he's very humble about it. But I'd be interested to hear your perspective on the emerging business models, the actual ways that we can form capital in completely new ways that uh, someone that went to Harvard Business School last year will not even know about. Sure. So I think, like, to, to, to follow your point, I think we're actually seeing, and on the inside, we're seeing it really well, the formation of the new economy. And there will be many people and many organizations who will be left out of this unless they join and jump onto the, onto the other side and find their place how to participate in value creation of this new economy. Because what we're seeing is people are really creating this new economy, which is almost completely detached from the traditional economy as we know. And the value of this economy is increasing exponentially every year. So therefore, there are some you know, new business models that are forming that haven't been um, even you know, possible in the old way because of the properties of blockchain technology. Um, some of them are linked with the open source nature of the technology, where 
we're seeing uh, projects uh, raise funding by issuing a cryptographic token. And they create value by building up the project and creating a service or creating a platform and not charge anything for it. Uh, and the, you know, the whole idea is to basically create as much value for the platform and hold a share of those tokens. Uh, and as the transaction velocity of the platform increases, the price of those tokens is going to go up as well. So their whole business model is linked with appreciation of the cryptographic asset that they hold. And they're providing the service with the rest of the community to build the platform for free, effectively. And that's what we're seeing across the board. And there are many, many projects which are now starting to emerge, which basically offer this platform to anyone who can join for free. Uh, and yet they still have a mechanism of how to fund development and how to make, you know, make a living of it. So there are a number of areas. I mean, identity is one, decentralized storage, to give examples, um, encryption, decentralized security platforms, etc., etc. And we're going to see more and more. Coming back to the question of, you know, what are we, what are we most excited about? I think one of the answers that I haven't mentioned is, I'm most excited about themes and applications which we can't imagine <laughs> right now, because. This platform is a perfect platform for transacting and for storing value. And we don't know, and we can't imagine the applications that are going to be formed in the future. So just to pick on that point for a second. Sure. You mentioned, Nick, how installing a blockchain wallet is sort of like installing a bank. Not a branch of a bank, but a bank <laughs> on your cell phone, right? And so if you are a bright entrepreneur who with an idea, particularly in fintech, you're not going to build on anything else. It makes no sense today to start a fintech company that's not built on blockchain. Sure. Because the cost of the software development is so much lower. There's a whole series of things that you could do that would generate this much value. And if the cost of the building <coughs> is this much, they never get built. And all of a sudden, we have dropped the cost of building financial services to this. And so there's a ton of unimaginable use cases that are suddenly enabled. And you build on a community, I think, so that's very important as well, is that, which is, the regular FinTech would try to, you know, do a prototype MVP and then hopefully get maybe three clients in and then sell their business to a VC and hopefully with a VC they're starting to get to a big business and then start to reach through marketing, uh, you know, uh, their, their, their clients. I think so the difference what you have in, in blockchain is that in the beginning, you're starting to build a community, right? And with the community, you reward them in different tokens. And, and that's in a very decentralized way. So it's really interesting. You would see like Steemit, for example, is one investment we like very much. It's a blockchain that has done something really, really cool. Is that essentially what they do at Steemit, if you heard about Reddit or Facebook, maybe that's maybe more of a limit, <laughs> is that, uh, Essentially, when you post something on Facebook, you post contents, right? You pick pictures of your children, of your wife, and you get likes. So, what's really cool about it, you feel very happy because your ego goes very high and you feel that you're, you're bringing good, good contents. But behind that, Mark Zuckerberg and Facebook, essentially, are making a lot, a lot of money, right? Because they're using that content to advertise you and this and that. So, what Steemit has done is that whenever you produce content, and you get a lot of likes, you're actually, you know, you should be rewarded for that, but not only on Echo. So what Steemit is doing, you're actually getting tokens and money out of all your content you're posting. So that's that's like a, a one a company that's really using decentralization and swarm intelligence through it. And I think so that's really good. Yeah, those are super interesting. I wrote down three use cases I'd heard in the last week that were starting to pique my interest. Um, decentralized storage is a pretty big one. Most of the devices we use have latent storage on them. Imagine if you could just lend that to the cloud and get some money back for basically just giving up an asset uh, that you weren't using. Um, so there's a firm uh, just a few weeks ago that raised a colossal amount of money in our industry um, to do just that. They're building a decentralized platform to essentially leverage latent storage on everyone's devices. Um, domain names are pretty interesting. Uh, I heard an entrepreneur um, just last week pitch me on an idea I'd never even thought of before. 
Uh, domain names are like uh, having real estate uh, in, the, you know, in, the, in the digital world. Um, and so imagine if you owned you know, vodka.com, but no one wants to buy it from you because you're trying to sell it for $10 million. It's probably one of the most expensive domain names in the world. If you could actually lease that domain for temporary periods of time, and actually trade tokens to build things uh, on it temporarily, um, just like pop-up stores. Social networks are an idea that uh, are very obvious to me. Um, imagine if we could have all invested in Facebook from day one, and for contributing and participating on the network, we would have received value, and all the advertisers that were putting money on there would have been paying all the people that are participating on the network. If you're talking about like network effect platforms, network effect value systems that reward the people that participate on them. So you've got lots of interesting things that collapse on top of each other. Um, so really interesting business models. Um, what, what you have, I think if you want to think about it a little more analog, imagine if you could give this thing instructions. You know, if I wanted to, to pay off a debt tonight and I needed to pay uh, Alex for something, you know, I'd have to walk over there and hand this to him or maybe I'd fold it into a paper aircraft and send it that way. But actually, if we're not in the same room, things get difficult. But if I can represent this digitally, and no one in the world could prevent the transaction from happening, and it would store in a record-keeping system that all of us could see that the transaction had occurred in, and then I could give it some other instructions, like, oh, after one week, I want you to take 20% of it and put it into your son's savings account. I want you to take another 15% and invest it in Cyrus's company in Switzerland. And then if he doesn't do what he was supposed to do, you get back 5% of it, and you put it into somebody else's project. That's the world that we live in now, and a lot of people are still running around using these things. So anyway, I think, like I said, the world was going to get a little weird. Um, I hope you're starting to see a bit of the world we're, we're sort of witnessing. Um, I know we're probably going to have a lot of questions, um, so I'm going to ask one or two more, and then I think it'd be great to, to get some from the audience. Um, as you guys have all left uh, impressive careers working for some of the most established financial incumbents on earth with all of the resources, um, what is it that made you stake your career? What is your investment thesis on the choice you've made to dedicate your life to what you're working on now? And start with Dan. Um, so I, my, 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 my introduction to Bitcoin was very, very simple. I, uh, I sent $10,000 of my own money to the Agricultural Bank of Shenzhen, and I never thought I'd see it again. Um, but fortunately, uh, I received some Bitcoins, and, and I began to play with them, and I began to study blockchain, and I, and I began to think about the nature of money. And I, I looked at the definitions of money, but I came to the conclusion that money was really about community. So I tinkered with all this stuff for, for maybe a year. Um, and the first time that I actually exposed myself to the community itself, the Bitcoin community, was in Amsterdam in May of 2014 at the famous uh, Bitcoin uh, conference, Bitcoin Foundation conference, where Nick was a, uh, a star and, a, and, a, and, a, and an up-and-coming um, uh, entrepreneur in the space. And I must say, I'm not blowing smoke uh, in his private parts, but there was, there was an enthusiasm for this community and this digital space, the likes of which I hadn't seen in 25 years on Wall Street in any asset class. And I met some very smart, very hardworking, very motivated people. I was absolutely taken by the enthusiasm. Um, so that combined with the technical nature and the puzzle about money and the general iconoclastic um, uh, libertarian and somewhat um, contrarian uh, aspect, which I pretty much run my career with up until that point, uh, it became uh, it became a very natural transition, and, and it's been I would have to say extremely hard work, especially recently, um, but it's about the most fun I've ever had. Thanks, Tim. Are there any? <laughs> yeah, if I if I think about so back to four and a half years ago, I think my investment thesis, which was basically like what do, what do you want to do next with your life. Um, I think it just came down to wanting to do something radical. Like, don't do a half step. Don't do something incremental. Don't do something that adds a little bit of value to the world. Try to do something that maybe does a lot, like a, a lot, a lot, and and go for something a little bit out there and and a little bit uh, strange. And um, I, I, I liked uh, some of uh, the outside thinking that was in the community, and also the the people were really smart and. 
I don't think I'm a judge to say whether you know it, it was going to go anywhere or not, but at, at least there was going to be a ride that uh, could potentially produce exponential returns. So I'm, I'm, I'm pretty happy with the way I spent my time. About four years ago, most people would have said that what he did was career suicide, <laughs> for sure. My mom definitely said that. <laughs> See, John. Um, I think I made my choice a very long time ago. Um, when I picked it as um, photography as my uh, core yeah. subject in my master's in 2004, um, do you know, it's very simple. What fascinated me was just the concept of a private and public key that you can arrive at something that others can verify but they can't create in, in the same way. It's just that, that simple concept, it's the foundation of a lot of what we've talked about and it's so simple, but it's, it's fascinating, it, it really is. So that's where my interest started and I got lost in the world of financial services for a while. I was working with merchants fighting over pennies of card processing fees for years and, um, you know, the, the opportunity to, to actually go and be part of what I think is a revolution, to, to be part of something which fundamentally changes the world, that my 12 year old's in the back, you know, it'll change the world for her. Um, so that's what excited me, just uh, I, I call myself a, a maximalist on a, on a blockchain level. I want to buy my car on the blockchain, I want to buy my house on the blockchain, I want to buy my coffee on the blockchain in the future. So I think that's what excites me and that's what gets me out of bed every morning. Thanks. Jeremy? Uh, so I ended up coming at this quite analytically. Um, I had done a lot of work in big data um, and was starting to look at the next ecosystem I'm going to go into. I started looking at FinTech in London and realized FinTech was too large. And then along with a research analyst at our firm, uh, we started calling up blockchain companies and uh, spoke to at least these four as far as doing it. And we started off, we were trying to talk to the, all the Bitcoin companies in Europe. That was a very short list. Except for whenever we'd call up and ask, well, do you know so-and-so doing such and such a thing? We ended up talking to more and more people. And at that point, at about this time in 2015, there'd been about a billion dollars invested in the space. And we talked to companies that have raised something like 850 million of the billion. And the other one that we didn't talk to at that time was 21, which had raised 120 million. <laughs> and so we were like sort of one company short of surveying the whole ecosystem. Um, and it just became, the analysis we did, which is on SlideShare, was pretty accurate, I think, looking back at it. It was very obvious that this was both going to be an enormous and revolutionary software market, as well as would rewire finance and a whole bunch of other business processes. Um, and as a result of that, I ended up going, I talked to every blockchain company in the world pretty much. I decided to de-partner from my prior firm um, and go into this full time and ended up talking to a bunch of companies in the space and having the strongest mission and cultural fit with consensus. To me, I think somewhat selfishly, I decided this was probably one of the most interesting spaces right now where your mind is just blown by the potential applications and implications of this technology. And uh, it's just a very, very interesting space to be in because of the opportunities which are presented by some of the projects and, some, and the technology itself. Um, the other thing was I, I was also at that conference and you know there were like a couple of hundred people who really wanted to change the world and there was no way back from that point it was just you look at individuals who want to democratize access and remove frictions to us as consumers and I think this is the one technology which is going to bring probably the most value back to the consumer and back to the user as opposed to keep it in the hands of central parties and big corporate organizations, etc. And that's where you know enterprises will need to reevaluate and change their business models pretty soon in order to survive in this world. Because the world where, where they could control access or they could control assets or they could control identities or fortunes of people is going to get crushed. And therefore they need to just imagine and reevaluate what is their role going to be in this world? And, you know, it's just super interesting from, from the intellectual challenge point of view.
Sorry. Yeah, I can really agree on what Alex is saying. I mean, I got introduced to Bitcoin because originally my dad wanted to buy some booze in Iran, and uh, <laughs> it was a good way for him to actually me to send him some money through Bitcoin, and he could then actually buy some wine or whatever he wanted in Tehran. So I got into that first. I was, yeah, it's a cool way to start business. Uh, the sad story is that I sold a lot of Bitcoins after Mongox, so I'm definitely not part of the rich multi-million dollar guys. Uh, that was a sad story, but, but I got into it quite early. Uh, then actually, you know, I, I you know worked for Algo Traders and banks before, and uh, you know after working in the hedge fund, we privileging the wealthy people to get more wealth and more wealth and more wealth. I just realized that uh, you know it could be you could probably do same on the very international scale and really redistribute wealth in a more democratized uh, way. So I thought uh, you know after traveling, growing this beard, long hair, it made more sense to me to leave the hedge fund industry. Anyways, no one would, would be working with me, and uh, so I went into blockchain, and where everyone now is pretty cool and everyone likes it. is very open-minded about everything. And the, the beauty of everything, if you're a lawyer, investment manager. A CEO regarding the tech side, your CTO, if you're in the marketing, the PR, and the polit as a politician, everything that's going through blockchain, it's, it's you have to create it. <coughs> Nothing has been built, and yet it, it will work if the consensus belief is a good thing. And I think so. We're really reshaping a little bit everything. Everyone's a little bit reshaping his company, but as well the society or which we're living. And obviously, to be part of it, it's it's amazing. Thank you. So obviously we have a lot of enthusiasm up here. Um, I think uh, let's put a little damper on it for just a second and have um, each of you answer the question, which is what is holding the entire ecosystem and industry back? To be clear and candid, the, the space today, if you were to, to wrap it up, is worth probably 160 billion-ish, give or take five or 10 billion, depending on the volatility of the afternoon, um, which is significant. And uh, so we're a tiny drop in the bucket of global assets right now. Um, so where, you know, what's holding us back and what do we need to do uh, to cross the chasm um, over the next 12 to, to 18 <coughs> months? And then after this question, uh, we'll open it up to the audience. So, uh, Dan? Um, yeah, I, mean, I, I, I think I have a particular uh, bugbear, probably um, not quite as applicable to uh, your other panelists tonight, but. Um, my, my, my biggest hurdle is, is essentially regulation, uh, financial regulation, because I mean, great, I had a great meeting today with um, a technology company who are trying to codify the, uh, the construction and the operation and the accounting for a hedge fund so that you can actually run a hedge fund with the same kind of technology as you're investing in with the hedge fund, i.e. digital assets. A very, very cool platform. But like any computer system, it requires a, you know, a distinct set of rules. And um, when you dig into this and you say, well, this would be great for a regulator because you could impose digitally the rules and regulations, the KYC, the, the politically exposed person checks, and all the stuff that you need to do in order to run a hedge fund in the legacy financial world, you could actually codify this until you realize two things. One, regulations are up for interpretation and computers don't interpret things very well and so a typical example would be when you go to a regulator and you say is this, am I good with this and they say well you've read the code you take the legal advice if you think it's good do it meaning if it screws up it's on you um, and, and we face that so that, that, that sort of uh, stops that from doing the second thing is um, you know and maybe again I, I, I'm just being slightly um, a conspiracy theorist here but I actually believe that um, regulation has become so knotty and so complex with Dodd-Frank and Sarbanes-Oxley and you know, re re reintroducing the Glass-Steagall Act in whichever form it comes, um, that this can no longer be unpicked. This, this mess, this hairball can no longer be unpicked. And that's why what we're all doing is kind of growing in isolation, as Alex correctly pointed out before. And, and I do believe that the, that the regulators have created a financial enterprise. It's called Finding People. Uh, I think the SEC was the most profitable corporation in the United States in 2010 or 11. Um, 
And now I fear that uh, as this ecosystem becomes stronger, I can already he I can already feel the tentacles, you know, reaching over because SEC lawyers, they, you know, getting paid a million bucks a year, they need to find people. And uh, as you probably saw today, they've now created a new cyber finding department that uh, finds guys like us. So uh, that that would be the thing I think is is, is most uh, impeding. Got it. So regulatory uncertainty um, overreached that. Danny. I think the, the regulatory challenges are um, significant. I also think they're temporary. Like I, I think um, regulators are spending more time in this area. I think it's incumbent on <coughs> us to give them uh, education about what's actually happening. And, and I think they will come around where there will be more uh, certainty and visibility in terms of what different actors who are participating in the space should be doing, what, what they should comply with. I, I think the, the longer term challenge is really more about um, utility. Like, We've talked about a lot of use cases today, and the real fundamental underlying benefit or value proposition, I think, needs to be focused on more and, and expressed more. Um, I think a lot of these tokens, uh, eventually the, the music is going to stop on the speculation, and people are going to wonder, what is this stuff good for? What, how is it really delivering fundamental economic value and I think that's where everyone should be spending their time in this space. And the nice thing about all the valuations is we have a lot of runway to do that. There's a lot of there's a lot of resources to do that. And I think it's fine to get wrong answers and mistakes, especially with that runway. But I think we have to be focused and really smart about how we do it to really uh, deliver products and services that are going to benefit the world. Thank you. Um, to agree on everything that's been said on regulations, so I'll, I'll say something different. Then. Um, I don't think we're being, you know, um, I think we're moving really quick. <laughs> um, I think if you look at, even if you look at how we started today's session, it was, what is blockchain? You know, um, for me to go up to someone and say, I'm going to create this magic money out of there, and it's going to be worth a thousand dollars, and that's what it's, you know, and it's yours. You can't touch it, you can't, you know, you can't print it, but it's got value. Um, I think that is such a significant change in how we attach value to something that it takes, it's taking its time, one roomful at a time, educating people into understanding what, what a blockchain is, what distributed ledger technology is, and how it all hangs together, and how it can be trusted. So, um, I actually think, you know, the last six, seven months have been incredible. Just the pace of people calling me, wanting to understand and see how they can make money out of it. Um, it's, it's, it's really been a whirlwind of progress. And I think uh, given how significant a shift it is, um, I think we're moving really quickly. Huh? Um, so I echo the point of regulation and agree with the other two points as well. Um, so, Instead of, and, and one challenge which I want to talk about is the, the needs so mentioned earlier from just the tools and the infrastructure to get better. But to come directly to the chasm crossing, the, the, if every fintech startup, if you believe the thesis I said earlier, which is if you're building fintech, you should build on blockchain, not on the traditional banking system, because you'll get to market faster and your product will be cheaper. What if you do that for an entire country or continent? So the area, one of the things that we're seeing is some of the jurisdictions that are closest to crossing the chasm are Singapore, Hong Kong, Dubai, and Luxembourg. And they are not playing for their local economy. They are playing for global leadership. And they are playing for a combination of the growth rates of their local, economy, local economies, mean it's the fastest growing economic region in the world right now, as an example. And they're playing for the two billion people who don't have access to high quality financial services. And they're playing on blockchain. And so one area where we spend, invest a lot of time and resources is in those four jurisdictions, working on um, largely government-led initiatives around blockchain adoption. Yeah, I mean, I'll echo the point. I think it's clear that regulation is number one. Uh, just, to do, just to do another one, I think I usually say it's a great time to be an investor in this space and it's not a great time to be a user and a consumer because the industry is still going through a maturity curve so user experience and convenience of some of the services or most of the services is not amazing 
And that's a function of some critical infrastructure components that are still missing and they're being built out at the moment. And therefore, you know, for me, I want to see those critical infrastructure components to be plugged in and to be built. And at that, at, at that stage, we'll see much more convenience and, and much more use for consumers uh, when, when they're using those applications. Yeah, on that point as well, uh, regarding investing, I mean, it's definitely a good thing if, you know, you're, you're investing, you're closing your eyes and <coughs> each year check out, you know, your, your, your current state of your portfolio. But if you're doing this on a daily basis, checking it, you could have drops of 30%, 20% on your portfolio. Uh, so it's, it's a kind of industry that I, I would recommend everyone to get it, whatever your age, your risk profile is. Just skew it to the, to, to the minimum if, it, if, you're, if you're not, your risk tolerance is very low. But it's something that is extremely volatile and uh, you have to know that. That's, that's the thing for sure. And regarding regulations, I couldn't really agree. It seems though that there's some countries that are much more favorable uh, than others. Uh, I mean, based, based in Switzerland, I can only say that we're taking the right steps. The government is uh, really passionate, I say, about Swiss, about uh, blockchain in general because it's decentralized in Switzerland in some way. It has this type of animus. It's quite a free trade zone as well. So there's a lot of different companies, quite innovative countries, and that. So there's some countries that are very open-minded to blockchain. And then there's some other countries, you know, uh, that like uh, you know the states are, I think, so doing the wrong, making the wrong decision of uh, forbidding ICOs, as security, putting them as, as securities, and making sure that you know it's it's a harder game for, for young startups to to get their word to say. Thank you. So you hear a common theme, which is the regulatory uncertainty, and uh, that's definitely been something that's been difficult for startups in our industry for the past five six years. Um, that has matured significantly. Um, and there has been more thoughtful guidance. There still needs to be that space where entrepreneurs can test and build things um, without fear of repercussions. And happy to say the UK has a pretty thoughtful framework around that, but the other countries, Jeremy mentioned, are also very, very progressive. Um, I think product focus, to me, is the most obvious one. When you build great things that people end up using and they rely on them, then you have all of the network effect and the credibility you need. And so our industry really just needs to build amazing, better products that are 10 times more efficient, more cost savings, and better than the incumbents. And if you look at all of the costs that they have, I, I think we can do that. Um, we just, it's a lot of work. Um, the hype cycle is very real. The industry goes through what looks exactly like uh, growing in retraction periods, like a normal economy, except there's no central bank changing or managing or you know, manipulating the monetary supply. And so instead of the, uh, the thrashing looking very even keeled, it goes a lot more like this. Um, but you have a real market, and that's why that's happening. Uh, I think emerging and frontier markets are incredibly interesting. These are places where you can bring digital efficiencies at scale much more quickly. The big challenges in those markets are that you don't have bandwidth. And so if you're delivering digital services, you need end users to have smartphones. You need them to be able to access the grid, and they're going to need the ability to get lots of information around. Um, so there are real limitations on that. Um, and I think uh, it's very poignant to point out that there's a lot of maturity that needs to happen. But uh, I've made this point in the past that if the entire history of our industry was a clock, we're probably in the third or fourth second. Um, you guys hearing about this tonight are literally at the forefront of learning about some of these things. Um, and that's because the ideas are complex um, and the technologies can be confusing. Most people here are probably not experts in cryptography. And despite that most of you are probably highly intelligent, I doubt that most of you probably know how email works. But that doesn't matter. You know that you can send a message to anybody instantly, basically, for free, and that that has utility and that has value to you. So if you could do the same thing with any asset, with your identity, with information, wouldn't that have value to you? Um, I was talking to John before I came up here, who brought up a great point. He goes, what about China? You know, they're, they're banning ICOs. They're coming down hard on the exchanges. This has been all over the news in the past week. Again, the, the regulatory concerns. How many people in this room would not have invested in Google, Twitter, Facebook, WhatsApp? Anybody would not have invested in those? Because all of those are banned in China. You might have lost a little bit of an opportunity, but maybe I'd be interested to hear your point of view on that. Um, but all of those are now banned in China. So don't be too fearful about what some specific markets choose to do 
with how they defend or protect their innovation or not. Um, there is an incredible amount of upside uh, across this space, and I hope you've uh, gotten a bit of a sense for where we're headed. Um, I don't know how we're doing on time. I think we've got 10 minutes or so. So um, we we'll probably have some questions. I know some of the panelists um, will hopefully stick around, and you should you know, pick their brains um, and get their advice on things. And uh, I'd be happy to help facilitate answers to questions from the audience. Um, go with the lady here in the fourth row. Yep. Uh, thank you. Uh, one of the hotly debated friction points in cryptocurrencies is actually the role of miners. Uh, critique is centered mostly on three points. Um, the fact that miners, for example, for Bitcoin, are pretty much gatekeepers, rising costs of them processing the payments, and uh, limited scalability, as it takes three uh, transactions are published only 10 minutes, every 10, 10 minutes, and I think in Bitcoin, the limit at this moment is like 2,200 limits, uh, 2,200 transactions published every 10 minutes, right? So if there are millions of transactions happening, there's a very long wait list, right? Which means that even if I make the payments now, it will take a few days before someone receives the payment, same as with my bank banking system. So I wonder what the panelists really think about this, how they address the, the critique, and whether we can actually start talking about blockchain or Bitcoin 2.0 with different role of miners to make a different system established for distribution of cryptocurrencies as well as for their publishing. Thank you. So we have an expert <coughs> in the audience. Um, <laughs> I'm going to pick on someone uh, to answer that because I think if we go through everybody, we'll run out of time for some other questions. So, um, Alex, if you just would answer the question around scalability in general and um, maybe some of the plans to address uh, latency across these networks generally. Sure. So the, the broader point is in, in, blockchain, in the blockchain world and blockchain platforms all compete with one another. So. If there's friction on the Bitcoin side, there are platforms that are emerging that remove that friction. And therefore, if Bitcoin friction becomes a big, big, big headache, people will migrate. So therefore, it encourages the Bitcoin community and Bitcoin miners and players in the ecosystem to actually agree on how to scale the platform. There has been a lot of time that you know, the community has spent on trying to find a solution. And the other solution is actually to basically what you know what's called a, to fork the platform, to create another version of the platform that has some of the initial properties of the Bitcoin platform, but has some key fundamental tweaks that improve or change the, the properties of the platform. And now we have effectively two Bitcoin platforms, right? Bitcoin and Bitcoin Cash. And that that was you know, from the point that you mentioned, the scalability issue and people having an alternative view on scalability of Bitcoin. So they, you know, they launched another version. No, one's, no one could stop them in doing that. And that's probably the power of open source blockchain platforms where if part of the community doesn't agree with the evolution of one platform, they have the freedom to launch their version and they have the freedom to convince users that their version is better. So therefore, users will naturally migrate if they think that that platform is better. The other, the other point goes to all the other blockchain platforms like Ethereum and et cetera, et cetera. There are now more Ethereum killers than, uh, I don't know, applications in the world. So I think we'll, we'll just go through a natural evolution. And these problems will not be technical problems, but they're going to be business problems and end user problems, where users will have the freedom to choose which platform fits to them best. Yeah. Basically, these networks have so many people using them already that just like a highway that has too many cars on it, it slows down and there's latency. And then there's differences of opinion about how to solve for that. You could add more lanes, you could do VIP lanes where you charge people, you could build a double decker highway, you build a hyperloop, and those are analogs uh, to explain this a little bit, but uh, it's complicated, um, but basically the market gets to choose. There are thousands of different communities and projects chasing solutions to this. Um, so we now have competition uh, that we hope, I think, for consumers will provide the best options in the long run. So lots of other questions. Um, in the back there, man, gentlemen. How can artificial intelligence uh, accelerate the adoption of blockchain? Who's our AI expert here? <laughs> I'll take a stab. 
think it's just start with normal intelligence. Who's <laughs> <laughs> regular intelligence? All right, go. Uh, so I would go all the way to artificial intelligence. I would just take a look at visualizations of ICOs. Um, so you can go in and do and look at the kind of data you get out of blockchain transactions versus what you get in traditional financial markets. So if you go and watch an ICO in real time, it's one of the most fascinating intellectual exercises you ever need to do. You know, Etherscan or Etherstats or Lethio or whatever, and go and just watch it. So the intersection of AI and blockchain is probably some way off, but already the data science tools that have been applied to big data are being used to do real-time analysis on the blockchain, and it's incredibly cool to see. If you compare it to the kind of data you get in traditional financial markets, it's just mind blowing. Yeah, to Jeremy's point, so you know, a lot of major financial institutions have to report quarterly, you know, on what's going on with their finances, and everyone has to speculate on what's going to be revealed, right? Well, with digital currency companies, you actually can have transparent optics into the existing state of network conditions or the current firm, and so applying machine learning or algorithms to that in real time, as opposed to looking at historic data will provide incredible opportunities for insight in the immediate. Um, so when people talk about the like confluence of some huge technology trends, uh, AI and blockchain are frequently mentioned in the same sentence, and it's partially because of that. I want to I wanna just give one use case, potentially. And if you remember what Danny said about why lawyers still have a job, is because of <laughs> interpretation of law. Yeah. I think when you combine artificial intelligence with smart contracts, lawyers will potentially be out of a job because artificial intelligence will bring that interpretation to smart contracts. Yeah. Um, in the back over there, sorry, yes. <coughs> 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 yeah, behind you. We have a company which publishes the data, and we're very attracted by uniqueness and, and by um, distributed ledgers to solve the problems of the digital rights management wanted to solve but kind of didn't solve. It seems to us that the things that have been very helpful we talked about help us create uniqueness in the way that information flows to our customers and, and, and who is consuming what. Then we come along to, to, to these sort of seminars and we hear a lot about, about uh, money, you know, about, about this is a thing that replaces money and it confuses me because we'd much rather not be part of ICO. We don't really want to be part of the whole money thing around Bitcoin, we just, around blockchain, we just want to use distributed ledgers for helping create uniqueness in the way we publish data to our clients. And I just heard the very helpful definition about the five things that you use to define the uh, blockchains and, and the item tokenization. And are we going to be drawn into having tokens if we want to use uh, distributed ledgers to uniquely define pieces of content that are published to clients? Jeremy? <laughs> um, I, I'll take a quick stab at that. Uh, the answer is I'm not sure. Um, I think there's some really interesting business models, though, that maybe we can explore after uh, this. If you think about um, some issues with content delivery on the web today, if you post an article up or you've got a song or uh, some music, you know, you've got all these paywalls and uh, the cost of transactions. Yeah. I think most of the audience gets that, I'm really sorry, but I'm really interested in, in, in whether we're going to be drawn, those of us who want to use this, this, this technology okay. to, to unique, create unique, we're going to be drawn into having tokens. Yeah. I don't, sorry, go ahead. I don't think you will. Um, I, you know, in what I said earlier is the potential in this underlying technology and what you could do is you could create a system that serves your purpose. So. Uh, although a lot of businesses are actually, in some cases, shoehorning a token into a model which will work perfectly fine on the Ethereum network, it doesn't necessarily mean that you should. In fact, uh, when investing in ICOs, uh, I'm sure we all have our own ways of qualification, but one of the one question I ask is, can what they're trying to do be done without a token? Yeah. yeah. Is, is there a fundamental need for these guys to do ICOs? That's what I'm asking for. Right? And, <laughs> Can we do with all the so, Sure. Um, yeah. Today, if you were to rewind six months ago, everyone would be talking about public blockchains versus private blockchains. And very and, and helpfully, that distinction is disappearing very quickly. Um, but sure, when we scorecard those five attributes or enterprise use cases, we look to try and get a, a four out of five on two dimensions. And if we see a four out of five on two of the five dimensions, then we think we can beat IBM and Oracle at building an enterprise solution using blockchain technology. Um, and 
in the earliest enterprise adoption, it's definitely been avoiding the token and trying to use digital signatures and digital ledgers and, and distributed ledgers and what have you. Um, however, um, you still need a way to meter and monitor your service and the usage of it. And that in itself is a form of tokenization. When people use Azure, you, the first thing you do is you buy Azure credits and then you spend Azure credits, right? And that is, in fact, tokenization. Um, it's just you know, not, a, not a digital token. So even in the enterprise space, you still need a way of monitoring and measuring stuff. So um, which is why, and this can be a little bit technical, when JP Morgan took Ethereum and created Quorum, they didn't take out Ether and gas. It's because they knew they needed a mechanism for measuring how many compute cycles were being used inside of the system. So you're always going to need a you're always going to need some sort of measurement metric and token solve that elegantly. I, I would go almost further and say uh, the, the token is the main use case for a blockchain. I think this idea of a, just a general distributed database, um, you already have distributed database technologies. I think the, the token piece is the real um, differentiator of this. It's, it's what's really set us apart from other database technologies. All right. I think we'll have one more question. Um, we know we have a lot, so I'll take it from the lady in the middle here. And then we'll stick around and we'll answer questions afterwards. I'm interested in your view of uh, the sort of quantum technologies. They say that quantum technology could break the distributed ledger technology. All right. What happens when a quantum computer breaks SHA-256? We start using quantum encryption algorithms. I mean, we've already added zero-knowledge proofs to Ethereum. When the crypto algo changes, the crypto algo changes. It won't take away the value of having vertical computing. It won't take that way. It won't take away the value of democratized finance. It won't take away the value of instant transfer of the trade being the settlement. We'll just use quantum algorithms, and the whole network will run a lot better actually because it'll be a lot faster. In the event that that were to happen to you, all credit card systems, nuclear launch codes, and most other tools would be shattered too. So this system was probably faster to adapt to um, a systemic change like that. But uh, yeah, we would apply quantum resistant. All right, thank you guys very much. Hope that was helpful. Uh, hopefully the panelists will be able to stay as well. And if you're interested in investing in this space, our next pitch event will be hosted by one of Nick's investors, Tom Holm, on November 7th. So I encourage you to register for that as well. Thanks.